Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for another class summit. Uh, and today, uh, we're here to talk about investing in non-traditional defense tech innovators. And I'm joined by uh, Mickey Bressman, CEO of Sempris, and General David Petraeus. Uh, and my name is Martin Glenn, and I'm from Accenture. And I wanted to begin with, Mickey, maybe a brief overview of your company uh, for our listeners today so they can understand a little bit about your products and, and customers. Sure. So Sampras is one of the fastest growing cybersecurity companies in North America. We're specifically focused on the identity side of things, identity resilience and threat mitigation for the hybrid environments. We serve some of the biggest enterprises in the world um, from Fortune 1 and so on. Um, with the promise of protecting them in the pre, during, and the post-attack stage, basically ransomware and similar. Interesting. And so maybe we can begin at the beginning, right? If we scroll back 10 years when you had the idea to start Sempris, what was your motivation or passion around starting this company? Sure. Um, so Sempris is actually my second company. And in my first company, I was the CTO, and the company was serving multiple different organizations in different disciplines, vectors. And one thing that was common across all of them is that the core of their identity store was the Active Directory. So all of them had this one system from Microsoft used across the entire organization that they're all completely dependent on. And I've seen with two of our customers, that's how it started. Um, I seen a situation where this system went down. In, in one case, it was done by an insider threat type of a person. So somebody basically decided to take the system down as a revenge on the company. So a malicious act. Completely. Yeah. And what was astonishing to me is that it took the company several days to recover. Now we keep in mind that since this is the authentication system for the organization, nothing works no billing, no invoicing, nothing, completely shut down of the organization. And what was even more astonishing to me at the time is that I was looking at from the perspective of all of my customers have this exact same system that they're using. And the recovery process for all of them is extremely painful. And there is no way to bounce back in a way that is sufficient enough as well this way. So I had a chat with who today is my co-founder and CTO. At the time, he was a senior PFE and lead for identity at Microsoft EMEA. And I asked him, something here is really weird. All of those organizations have the same identity system. All of them have the same challenge, but there is no good solution to what will happen if that system goes down. And that was kind of the starting point of how the company started. Of course, we didn't have the crystal ball. We didn't see runs that were coming yet because it was before the wave. But after, I think, three years or so, we kind of been in the right place at the right time, being able to assist those organizations now with the ransomware and attacks that they're experiencing. And how has it changed since you know you began this ten years ago, right? You noticed the problem. It took so long for these companies to recover. How has your your business model today helped your customers, you know, resolve these challenges? So I think there are multiple things that changed completely. Uh, it's a bit less than ten years, but one of the things that definitely changed completely is. is I remember that at the beginning, you had to explain why would one need um, a disaster recovery solution for something like that in the directory. Because again, ransomware was not yet a thing. So we used to spend time to educating the market on what happens if you're being hit by a cyber threat uh, one way or the other. And this is no longer the conversation. I think the conversation that we're having now is, you all know that ransomware is a matter of if in most cases, of when, I'm sorry, as opposed to of if. And the question becomes, how resilient can you be? What I sometimes have conversation with customers about is that you can't necessarily prevent everything, but what you can do is to make sure that you're resilient enough to sustain whatever is coming. Interesting. In general, Petraeus, how long have you known Mickey? And what made Mickey and Semperus uh, an interesting investment for, for KKR? I guess it's a few years that we examined and then invested in Semperus. And I should note that I'm not just, again, a partner in KKR, which uh, has made the largest investment in Semperus. I'm also the, a strategic advisor for Semperus, and I'm a personal investor yeah. uh, in Semperus. And frankly, what happened here is what happens in any investment, but I think it's particularly true of startups. 
what you're trying to evaluate or, or later stage, we don't do true venture investing at KKR. For candidly, it's too small. If you're investing $520 billion, which is our assets under management, um, you have to invest in a slightly later stage. We call it next-gen technology. So it's at least 25 million in annual recurring revenue to just start get interested in it. And right. then what we're always doing though is the same as when you do invest in a startup. And I should note that I've invested in about 27 startups as an individual, as many of the partners at KKR do over the last 10 years, you're evaluating the big idea. In other words, the product, if you will. And we're very impressed by what this product provides. We saw it as a need in the cybersecurity landscape, uh, which requires a, a large number of different capabilities, products, applications, all of which have to be uh, integrated, managed, and so forth, and based on a zero trust uh, architecture, uh, ideally. So there was a need for this. Uh, we thought it was quite powerful. Uh, and we saw that the leadership uh, of the company, uh, Mickey and his co-founder, uh, was very impressive as well. So again, it's always about the leaders and the big ideas. And with respect to the leaders, you want individuals that not only have the technical expertise, which Mickey and his co-founder and, and their team clearly do have, um, you also want to have leadership that will be able to scale the company. So you're not going to have this situation where, you know, the g individual is a technical genius, but can't lead the company as it becomes right. bigger and bigger. And then you go through a leadership transition, which can be disruptive and, and, and challenging. So in this case, we felt very good about both of those aspect, aspects and then really about the team and, and the trajectory and the possibilities. Because keep in mind that what we are right, and what we think what made us attractive to Semper is, is that we bring certain qualities, it's not just money. You can find money in an awful lot of places. It's about the overall uh, aspect of being a strategic partner to bring expertise, to bring relationships, to bring uh, our, our own skill in a whole host of different areas that will become increasingly important as the company gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, eventually it's going to be either will to help them go public uh, or some other transaction at a certain point in time. So there's a great deal of financial know-how here, and a variety of other uh, skill sets and, and areas of expertise that KKR has that we think make us very attractive to a company uh, like like Semperus. And in this case, I should note that I think I actually talked to Mickey, and I said, you know, Mickey you should be making a list of the qualities and attributes you want in a potential strategic partner. Um, and, you know, put it aside, share it with others, just flesh it out, keep playing with it, and then evaluate us. Yeah. You know, I think I'm confident that you will not find a quality and attribute that we can't provide. We like to believe we're the best strategic partner possible for a company like his. Um, but you should do that regardless. Uh, and then, you know, see how that works out because obviously there are a lot of other companies that also that's saw a, that's a, great point. Uh, a very attractive, again, big idea and a leadership team, and then gradually the, the team overall as well. It's a great point. And, and, you know, contrarily, right? How did you see KKR? Right, you, they could, KKR couldn't have been the only suitor. Well, and, you, and then part the of the deal came, was he said, yeah. you know, well, if you'll be the strategic advisor, right, you know, okay, we have a deal. Yeah, that, that, and that, and that, I have helped them. I mean, yeah. a, a lot actually. Um, yeah. And again, I I I'm on the boards of a couple of companies, including, by the way, the largest peer play cybersecurity services firm in the world, Optiv. So I, I yeah. and and of course I was part of the breaking and entering crowd back in the day, as a military commander uh, in the manhunt business, and then at the CIA, of course. So. I've seen cybersecurity and then also those who are trying to uh, crack cybersecurity. Um, and and again, we can help Semperus. You know, he says, I think one of the tests one time is, could you connect me with the head of this particular entity in the U.S. government? And I think five minutes later, she returned my email. So uh, again, that's what we do for them incredible. as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So how did you... And General Petraeus put forward a pretty good and compelling argument here. How did you see KKR and how did you evaluate and choose KKR against a variety of suitors? I'm sure that you you had uh, at that time. 
first of all, you're right. We had several options and, and yeah. KKR were aware of it. Um, I think there were several things that I really liked about KKR that really stood out. One, of course, the general, but that that's quite obvious. So I don't, and the story with the five minutes, you won't believe it. phone calls is pretty compelling. It, it yeah. was really five minutes yeah. and, and super it impressive. It would have been faster as a phone call. This is an email. <laughs> it like was that. an email, yeah. <laughs> So but I, I think to connect what, to the, what yeah. really attract me, attracted me in, in KKR is actually the KKR model. And I don't know how many people actually are, are aware of it. But what I mean by that, and I found it to be super interesting, is the fact that the way that KKR are structured is the fact that every one of the employees or individuals in KKR, non related to what is their role and responsibility, their bonuses are being paid on the success of the entire company. And that was attractive to me from several different perspectives. The first one, I strongly believe that if a company, and we apply the same motion in the company as well in Sempress, so everybody um, in the company is benefiting when we benefit as a company. But the thing that I found to be extremely helpful to me is that I can reach out, and I've done it multiple times now, but I can reach out to any person that works for KKR. Let's say that I want to have um, help in France as an example. And I can reach out to somebody in KKR friends and they will help. And they have all of the incentives in the world to go and do something and help you. And, if, and I found it to be extremely helpful. And then of course, you know, with everything that comes with the brand name like KKR, when you're backed up by one of the biggest um, private equities out there with the understanding and so on. The general mentioned some of the other things, but when the company starts to think about going public, what does it mean? What should you be thinking about? I know what I know, but it's probably yeah. limited. They've seen the same game played out thousands of times. So being able to tap into that type of knowledge is extremely helpful. Yeah, that's, that's impressive. I mean, great team ball, what I'm hearing, aligned financial incentives and great support, right? Um, we even have an entity that's called KKR Capstone that has, it's like an internal McKinsey. Yeah. Uh, it's about 70 to 80 people. They're all former senior executives in every area of a corporation. So we have expertise across the board and we draw on that. So if we need to have you know, HR expertise, if we need uh, back office expertise, if, if you need marketing expertise, sales, you name it, there's expertise there. And we can draw on that as required by the companies uh, that we're helping. And obviously there's a deal team, there's a lead and others that are sure. directly engaged with Semperus. But as Mickey noted, he can call on anyone and we're a global company. So you wanna go global, we can help you go global. Um, and not only can you call on again, the actual offices, members who are in these different countries, every one of the major countries around the world in which he would at least initially seek to expand but you know beyond that again you can call on me you can call on henry kravis who's got an incredible set of uh, relationships around the world george roberts our co-ceos and others um and so all of that when you put it together and we talk about constantly at kkr using the whole brain so everybody engages uh as is relevant as is uh, helpful and as mickey noted uh, it, it's not just the people on the deal team who benefit if Semperus does well, the whole company benefits from that. And, you know, this is not an enormous organization. This is not even yet still a brigade combat team, the size of organization, yeah. which I commanded as a colonel. It's still probably less than 2,500 people around the world that are managing over 520 billion, owning 120 companies and minority investments in, in another Hundred, and we don't own Sempers outright. I don't think. Do no, it, it, it's a growth investment. Yeah, it's so so we don't. You know, at some point we may. At some point, Mickey may say, "Hey, look, I'd really like to have a chairman of the board who's not one of us," um, because that's the process of guiding them, and then you get used to, it. and then you know, eventually we'll start getting into uh, practice earnings calls and all yeah. the other activities that are. These are real landmines if you don't get these right. And there's a lot of examples out there, especially actually in recent years of companies going public and then uh, not, not particularly prospering. I have no doubt that Semperus is going to continue to grow very, very rapidly. And again, we're going to help them do that big time. Talking about the success of the company, right? It's, you know, when I think of cybersecurity in the space you're in, and I think of the pace 
and 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 evolution of nation state actors that are out there trying to come up with creative and new ways constantly for um, infiltrating governments and companies, right, and your customers. How do you keep up with that pace of innovation? How do you keep in front of it? Can you get in front of it? Or is it something that you're always just a step behind? And uh, how do you, or are there parts of your business where you're ahead? Or are there parts of your business where deeper investment is required to get in front of these, these threats? How do, you, how do you plan for that? And really, the bigger question is, how do you manage that value back to your customers, Mickey, and to investors like KKR? It's got to be tricky to balance those two things. So I actually think, um, well, there, there was a lot of throwing back here, but I, I think first of all, from the investors and customers perspective, um, we're in this ideal, ideal situation where both benefit from what we do. Meaning if we do good in terms of our customers, then our customers are happy, our customers base is growing, which in turn makes the investors happy as well. So there I see no conflict at all. If I think it's actually beneficial to both sides. And, and in some cases, KKR will actually introduce us to some of the companies that they own because they want those companies to be better protected, which kind of makes perfect sense. And then also Optif, which again does in a comprehensive integrated cybersecurity solution Completely based agree. on zero trust principles. So again, you have all yeah. these synergies uh, that come from being part of, again, well over probably 230 or so companies that we own or are invested in. The partnership that we've seen with other KKR companies is indeed uh, a very big influence on how we go to market. And I mean, KKR, the investment happened, I want to say about a year and a half ago. And I think that the impact that KKR had was tremendous in terms of how the company thinks, how we operate, what we care about, what do we pay attention to, and so on. Now, to the first part of the question, what we do internally, we have a security research team that basically... Those are the same people that were employed in other organizations in order to break in. And what they do for us is so basically- hackers. Yes, yes exactly. Well, well, legal. Legal hackers, Again, of course. And so presumably a number of them from 8200, which is the yes. Israeli version of the NSA, as oh, an example. Sure. So we have Perhaps those- some from NSA, exactly. from other organizations around the world that have, again, legally with government authority uh, carried out- uh, essentially legal penetration testing, shall we say. Correct. <laughs> okay. And and the way it is as it is helpful is that we release indicators of exposure and compromise for our customers on a monthly basis. So every time that there is a major event that have either been discovered by us or by somebody else in the industry, our customers get the immediate protection that allow them to see if they're vulnerable, what to do, and so on. But I think again from my perspective, what is more critical is what is your resiliency level? Because I'm going to assume that zero days will always exist. And I'm going to assume that at some point you will be breached. And the question becomes, when that happens, is this the end of your organization? Or is this something that you, you can relatively easily overcome and move forward? So the resiliency aspect is what we're really focusing on. And don't get me wrong, we do the pre the attack, we do the during the attack. But I think that being able to keep the organizational resiliency in all aspects is the way that you go out of it. And again, keep in mind that there are diabolically clever, brilliant criminals, um, government hackers, uh, extremists. There's, a, you know, the the number of threats is very substantial, and it's constantly evolving. And you will be breached to, at some question, some point. The question is, how do you respond? How much do you lose? How how compartmented is it? A zero trust? You know, what's the architecture? Uh, what's the management level? How quickly do you respond? And then, by the way, how quickly do you remediate it, make the fixes that are required, then share that, of course, yeah. with the consortium that you're part of. Right. Uh, and of course, the bigger he gets, the more threat information he gets. He's also tied in with a number of other organizations, of course, that are sharing threat information and, and you know, the digital fingerprint, if you will, or the identity and so forth. Yeah. So, and the, and the larger that gets, in fact, the single biggest challenge, I think, actually, in grand terms today, when it comes to national cybersecurity, is the lack of real-time machine speed sharing of threat information and then the mitigation measures that are required. It exists within certain, again, consortia, yeah. Um, and there are just there are legal challenges associated with this. In other words, the government, if if they compel you to share 
and you do share and your stock price goes down, there are fiduciary, there, there's some complexity here. It sounds as if everybody should just be forced to do that. The government's working its way through that. The Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency uh, is coming to grips with this. Uh, but this is the kind of issue that, that has to be resolved. But within his world, there's real time, there's machine speed sharing. He's got brilliant people that pick this up, manage it constantly, react to it swiftly. And that's the real key. Because again, you do have to prepare uh, to be breached and you have to practice that and you have to have the tools and the expertise to do that. Yeah, in the early days, I think the big transition has been over the last five or 10 years is that companies can survive, right, and still thrive. And so that is a oh, big absolutely. pivot from five or 10 years sure. ago when people thought it was the death of their business when they were attacked. With the last few minutes that we have left, uh, I just want to, you know, you're 10 years into a business, right? You're three years, four years into an investment. What does Sempris want to be remembered for? What do you want to be remembered for as CEO of Sempris? You founded this it's a personal journey for you, as well as a business journey. Uh, how do you see your future and, and what do you want to really be remembered for, Mickey? It's it's a good question. It's an interesting one because we're still going. So I don't I don't <laughs> think it's being remembered. But it's what I think what we want to be known for is is being a force for good. This is basically the motto of the company. And and I want to think that we were able to make an impact in the general fight against cyber criminals. And doesn't really matter if those are bad actors that are financially motivated or, or if those are bad actors that are motivated for other reasons. I want to think that Sampras has an impact on what is happening in this game. And as a board member, hearing what Mickey's saying, what do you want Mickey to be remembered for? How do you want well, strategic advisors again? I, I'm not doing strategic any more. Words take too much time, and they don't need me sitting in on board meetings. What they need is they need me when they need me, and that's when. And Mickey yeah. doesn't hesitate to email and and let me know. Um, look, I think that Sempris will be seen and highly respected as an extraordinary uh, company and with a great product, uh, and it's going to grow. It's going to continue to grow. Uh, I believe that it's going to remain the best product in this particular area of identity verification management, and specifically Active Directory. We get arcane pretty quickly, but it's a very specific need that he identified that they've provided the product that that resolves, that solves this issue. Uh, they will keep up with the enemy as well. Uh, they'll keep outpacing the competition. And then I think the question really is down the road, mm -hmm. do they develop additional products? Keep in mind that to have adequate cybersecurity, right now you need a reference architecture of roughly 85 or so individual capabilities, products, you name right. it. Uh, you know, it's anomaly detection, endpoint artificial AI, uh, cybersecurity, it's identity verification management, it's pushed to the cloud. You know, I can list this in sort of plain English. It gets much more arcane. All has to be managed. Uh, it all has to be, uh, you even need cyber risk insurance. You have to train the workforce, train the, the system administrators, on and on. So this is one of those that every comprehensive integrated cybersecurity solution needs in it. The question I think is, do they create additional products uh, along the way that they recognize are needed? And, and again, there will be new threats for which there will need to be new responses, new applications, new uh, products, as I said. And then how much can they expand that? Um, one of these days, there's going to be a company that's going to be able to do uh, even more of this. I don't think there's any single company right now that can do everything. Right. Uh, Optiv crafts it, Optiv puts it together, it designs it, it manages it and so forth. But that's going to be the big, the big question down the road. They're going to be a huge success just with the product that they have. The question is, do they become even bigger, develop additional use cases for this one, develop additional applications, products, and so forth? And I think that's probably going to be the case. And then he's going to have to figure out, does he spin out additional companies? Does he keep it together? But then that's what we, that's what we do. Yeah. That's what excites us. And that's why we're frankly very enthusiastic and, and again, excited about being part of Sempris's journey. 
all great points. Clearly, you're not done yet. That's a long list of stuff. It's a very long list. So, uh, you and, know, it, you and get imagine being years. where he is. Yeah. That you're a co founder of a company yeah. that is already probably approaching a billion dollar valuation. So, I, I mean, we haven't done that lately. We won't do it. I don't even know if we'll need to raise additional. We'll just give them additional if they need it. Um, this is pretty extraordinary. And how old are you? You're not even 40 yet. No, you? no, I'm, I'm about 40. <laughs> you are 40. Okay. I mean, th but this is really quite extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, it does it, feel it's, like it's we, everyone's dream. It does feel yeah. like we just started a lot of things yeah. to do. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, tremendous journey at the intersection of tech innovation. Uh, I want to thank you both for the, the conversation. Lots you. of wisdom here for sure. A lot, of, a lot of learning for our listeners. And thank you all for joining us today and, and participating in our session. Thank you.